Uh, today we have Dr. Troy Jensen with us and he's going to present his research and experience in precision ag in a bunch of different crops, including sugarcane, cotton, horticulture crops. And Dr. Troy Jensen is an associate professor and principal research fellow in precision ag at the University of Southern Queensland in Australia. He's applying engineering technologies to agriculture since he commenced work with the Queensland Department of Primary Industries in 1987. Since this time, he has worked as an agriculture engineer, a research engineer, and has gained extensive applied research experience in ag machinery, precision ag, remote sensing, control traffic farming, grain storage, horticulture mechanization, intensive animal industries, biomass reuse, and unmanned aerial vehicles. Dr. Jensen joined the Center of Agricultural Engineering in Queensland and University of Southern Queensland in 2009, during which time he has been focusing on yield monitoring and precision ag applications to the Australian sugar industry. He also developed market entry solutions to precision spot spraying and providing technologies to monitor crops at a very fine spatial scale. And recently, he also received Fulbright Scholarship um, to visit UF here at the Everglades REC, uh, hopefully soon, um, and maybe this year or next year. So with that, I welcome uh, Dr. Jensen uh, to present his seminar. Thank you, Dr. Jensen. Thanks, Ardev. Um, it's morning in this part of the world, but good afternoon, you guys over Florida way. Um, so today, I wanted to have a to let you know some of the things that that I that I and we have been up to at the University of Southern Queensland. So, um, with 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 applications to precision agriculture and the other crops, as Ardev has mentioned. So um, a, a lot of what, we've been, what we'll probably talk about is sugarcane. So what I would thought I would do is give you guys a bit of a brief introduction on, of sugarcane and where it's grown in Australia. The little bit of this map that you can see showing is this little area enlarged up there. So where the sugarcane grown is in the northeast corner of Australia and primarily in Queensland. Uh, but the extent for the range with which sugarcane is grown is across 2,300 2, kilometres or 1,450 miles from far north Queensland down to, down to northern New South, South Wales in this part of the world. Toowoomba, where I'm based, is, is just west of... Um, 130 kilometres west of Brisbane. But um, so some of the photos that I've included there are some of the features, natural features. So all the way down this part of the coast is the Great Barrier Reef, which is quite sensitive to chemical inputs and, and production and runoff and all of that sort of thing. So there's a snapshot of some of the, the things on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, I think Oprah from your part of the world went over to this little Love Heart Island, which is part of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, this is myself, my two children, one's missing and my wife, up on the Great Barrier Reef. So we went up to Cairns, which is right up the top, and went out snorkelling. And that's actually my daughter snorkelling out on the Great Barrier Reef. So there's lots of natural features and wonders. We've got crocodiles as well. Um, Nemo fish, we saw a few of those when we were snorkeling on the reef and, and sea turtles. So I did a bit of a Google about Florida and the like. So I think you've got turtles similar to these guys and coral reefs and that sort of thing. So similar comparisons across the world. Um, so so that's that's all of my um, happy tourist snaps. So, uh, so how I got to where I'm at now. So uh, Hardev mentioned that I had... Be since before 2009, I was working in the Queensland Department of Prime Industries. So that's 
um, a state department of agriculture. So when I was working there, we were doing all sorts of things, looking at yield monitoring on grain harvesters, protein monitors had just been, protein monitors were being developed. We were looking for associations between protein and yield. So uh, the protein monitors were not, um, you know, they were supposed to be available. So we we decided we're going to do all of this work and we had these multiple data layers that didn't occur. So we had to come up with another way of getting an intensive protein data layer. So that required me sitting on that chair between the two wheels of that grain harvester, collecting samples that were geolocated from that sampling arrangement. So that then, so yeah. So we had a sampler, we had a palm top that was listening, looking at the GPS, recording the information, and then we had the person bagging the samples. That would then allow us to produce the, 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 the additional data layers of a yield map on the top left, which was conventionally available. We had a thousand protein samples to generate that protein map. But where we were wanting to get to is how much nitrogen had been removed and the like. So we were looking at trying to do replacement strategies, segregation of harvest, all of those sort of things that you can do when you've got those additional data layers. One thing we were thinking of is doing that is that that, previous, that protein map data set's only available for the next crop. So we started to go down the path of what can we do remote sensing wise that might give us an indication of what to expect come harvest time. So with that comes aerial imagery, satellite imagery, but they had limitations. So I started down the path of trying to collect information when and where we wanted it so that we could make those decisions. So that then in, in, inevitably led to use of UAVs, although this wasn't a, a, I call this one more a remote control aircraft because you still needed physically a pilot to fly it. That was above my skill set. A helium balloon, like you can see in the right-hand photo, that's me on the right, is more my skill set because you let it up with a, with a fishing reel, you pull it back down and take photos. So that's where my interest in, um, well, from yield monitoring into remote sensing and the like, which is which is part of the journey to where we've got to. So as part of that, I developed a, these are two Kodak, DC 3200 digital cameras. So they were state of the art at the time, one megapixel, nothing nowadays, but this had the electronics on there so that when um, you could trigger those cameras from the ground to take images. There's also a video camera on there so that we had video footage on the ground so we knew where they were positioned, et cetera, and some of those sort of things. So that's that camera arrangement strapped underneath a, a remote controlled aircraft. And so the, the pilot's getting ready to take off. So what that enabled us to do was to take, oh, I'm sorry, the, the reason behind the two cameras in that arrangement is one was to capture the colour information and another one had been modified to, re, to, to record only the infrared information so that we could do things like NDVI and the like. So that's what, so what you see on this image is, is the infrared. Can we get rid of this thing? I might just stay up there. So that's the near infrared image of a, so this was a wheat crop with varying degrees of fertilizer having been applied both N. So you can see there's plots there with different N values. There's plots there with different P values. And I think there's also some plots there that had different sulfur levels applied. So the color image is coming up next. So that's the color, color pair of the previous image. So um, you can see that, you know, you can see some gradation across there from the various plots. These plots were maybe two meters, two meters wide. They were paired plots and about 50 meters long. 
Sorry for um, talking in metric units. I'm, I'm not quick enough to convert them for, for you guys, but you'll have to just um, bear with me for the moment. So, so that enabled me to do some, some correlations between... So remember this, so that, that photo of me with the balloon was 2003, was the photo. So this was... Um, this is some work that was done subsequent to that. So looking at the vegetation, so this is differential vegetation into C versus yield was the best relationship that I had. So I had an R squared of 0.91 there between the, the information from that digital camera to yield. Um, similarly with protein, so, and you can see that I've got a range of nitrogen applied areas there that had quite nice groupings in that in that spread of results that we've got there. So an R squared of 0.66 for protein back then was, you know, pretty much unheard of. I think the best before that was maybe about a 0.4 or something. So that got got me thinking, well, you know, once you've got a tool kit, then we started looking for other things that we could apply it to. So we started looking at turf on football stadiums. Um, this is the main football stadium in Brisbane, probably not very um, impressive from what you guys have got because I think our seating capacity there is about 50,000. So I think the Gators Stadium has got more than that at the college. So, yeah. Not, but um, So we were there looking at the turf um, impacts on sunlight, where species varieties, that sort of thing. Started also looking at you know, with with this as a toolkit, starting to look at growth rates in lettuce. And here this was a student work where they were looking at uniformity from these from these hand placed sprinkler systems and how that impacted on the growth rate of lettuce. So took some images from the balloon, categorized it into lettuce and not lettuce, that the student was then able to say, well, why is this lettuce not going as well as these guys around it? And, you know, all of those other decisions. And so that approach is, you know, what you'll see in some subsequent slides coming up. So I then moved across to the University of Southern Queensland in 2009. And so there was, a, I went straight into a project on yield monitoring in sugarcane. This is a, a schematic of a sugarcane harvester showing all the components and the, the things highlighted in balloon texts is where people previously had been sensing values that were indicative of the throughput of material through that harvester. And so I went about evaluating that information to see what was going on. Yield monitoring uh, research is not at that stage there were a couple of commercial devices but there had been people working in that space for a little while so graham cox that i've noted there in 1998 was actually a usq student that did his phd on yield monitoring and so um others in so these two guys are from um brazil randy price is from your part of the world, um, Louisiana, maybe. So, the, so there's various patents taken out, uh, but but it hadn't really gone anywhere. And so I was went to evaluating uh, the the different devices that were available in Australia. Sorry, I've got this in the way because you can't see the text. Maybe I'll put it down the bottom. So I might just move this back up the top in a minute. So these were two different yield monitor devices available in, in Australia at the time. So it was a tech agro device and there was an ag guide device. And so I went about looking at different, so the, the, the image on the left is a high pour rate, so a high, uh, sorry, a low pour rate, a low throughput through the harvester. The image was on the right, which was a high pour rate through the harvester. So I harvested one row, slow, one row fast, one row slow, all the way across the field, extracted out those data sets to see how that impacted on how the, the
the yield monitor was able to 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 collect that information and make sense of it. And so, you know, and and what was done was we were then harvesting into a harvesting 50 meters into a way wagon behind the sugarcane harvester. So this is so in this bottom row, this is what we've expected the yield map should look like, and this is what we got. So it it didn't bode well for for um what we're looking at thinking well you know the, these devices aren't performing very well so we then decided to go back to basics and 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 some of the thoughts were it was how the, the data was being handled which created the problems some of the problems as to why we couldn't have confidence in what was going on so we come up with our own solution where we put a whole heap of sensors, all of those balloons that we saw on, on, sorry, wrong way. All of the balloons that we saw here, we had sensors to evaluate all of those, all of those um, data points that we could then use to generate yield. We had all of them going into a Campbell Scientific on a range of different harvests. So this is an Ostoft. Uh, up in Bundaberg, so and and so we could then go about uh, working on how we might go about handling the data. We came up with some protocols we we published in an um, Australian Society of Sugarcane Technologists conference paper, and so that gave us confidence that when you handle the data right, you can get to some sensible values that you can use for all sorts of other things. And so a lot of that was around the consignment. So these different colours that you can see here is sugarcane harvested on a particular day, so the date's noted there. But when you follow the protocols, you can then get a sensible yield map out of that information. And so this is then yield maps from each of the devices that we were looking at. So uh, CP is is looking at the chopper pressure, EP is looking at the elevator pressure, LC is the load cell in the floor of the elevator, RO is the roller opening, so that's how far the final feed rollers are separated as an indicator of how much material is going through. And then we had also, we were then harvesting 50 metres, putting it into a weigh bin, weighing it, and then harvesting the next 50 metres. So those are all of the data points that we used to generate that Krieg map, which enabled us to say, well, this is what we're looking for, this is what we expect to find in the field, and then comparing it to these guys. So this, sorry about that, this this was a, a reasonable um, a reasonable result where, you know, there's, there's consistencies that highs are all generally highs in all of the maps, sorry, the lows being red are generally the same in all of the maps. We've got a big a big low here, which we're picking up with all the devices. The high map, high parts of the map we're picking up. So, um, yeah, we, we, we thought that that, that was a, a reasonable result for where we were getting to. About that time, John Deere released their yield monitor. So you can see there's a, a clean green attachment to this, this rather dirty looking John Deere 3520. And so, we, we, so this was the first one, I think there might have been one in Brazil at the time. So we had, had um, the, uh, one of the Toft guy, so the Ostoft factory was in Bundaberg where they were producing the, the harvesters. Uh, I think it was Neville actually went across to Chemico. So we were, so the, one of the farmers we we're dealing with was a good mate of Neville Toft from, from, um, Toft days in Bundaberg, and so he, so they come up with an arrangement to get. So Toft Neville was working for Chemico, which then became John Deere, of course, and so the farmer had a personal connection. So he snared one of these, and so we were evaluating it back then. The, what we could also do was look at, you know, trash values. So this is the the screen in the harvester. So we, it had the capacity to. to monitor trash values. It also had flagging arrangements. So I did a, 
a whole combination of looking at the material. And so the harvester that had the John Deere stuff on it, we also had our sensors on there that we could evaluate um, the different sensors and load combinations and all of that sort of thing. And so here's a couple of haul out wagons behind tractors at one of the trials that we were looking at. So that's some of the sensors that we had on that uh, 3520. So this was on the final feed rolls. That was a linear potentiometer that we were using to look at the separation of the final feed rollers. A couple of pressure gauges. I think, yeah, that's on the chopper motor. So we were looking at the pressure before and after the chopper motor and the same up on the elevator. So that, and we had speed of the elevator that then enabled us to, to develop some maps which are coming up next. So I then tracked the, the sorry, the, the cane that was harvested into the haul outs when they were then tipped into these wagons is the, is the way that cane's distributed in Queensland, in this part, in Bundaberg region of Queensland. So these were the, each, then, each had an identified number that I then tracked to the mill, compared the, the sensor values from the harvester to the cane that was attributable to the cane that went into those individual bins that were then weighed at the, at the mill. So over four days, I, I, uh, so 15 days of cutting, there were 2,247 bins. I, I tracked them for four days, had 358 pins that we were then looking at to see how, how it responded. And so these graphs are the, so on the y-axis is, is the mill, so sorry, y-axis is the tons per hectare information and the dots that you can see are actual uh, wagon loads that, that went to the mill. And so I had a, a, a bin yield in, sorry, the blue color is what was actually measured by the, by the mill. The red or the maroni color is what was indicated by the chopper pressure values and the greener what was indicated by the elevator pressure values. So you can see that there's a, you know, sometimes it's quite close Sometimes it's within, you know, five or ten percent, but you know, further indication that there was some some good good alignment with what was going on, and so that's over a number of different days. And there's change of operators. I think this was a change of operator, and so you can see that the you know depending on how the harvester is actually performing and being operated then that can have impacts on, on the results you get out as well. And so that's just looking at the, the yield difference between what the, the mill was recording and what the yield monitor is recording. So the worst result was a 10% difference, but I think most of the time it was within, you know, definitely below five, you know, 95% of the time it's probably below 5%. So uh, yeah reasonable results coming out of that. So that enabled us to draw, so this one's a speed map from that uh, John Deere 3520. And so we were looking at, you know, what was some of the things that were driving the, the confidence that we could have in the, in the yield results. That's the yield map from the chopper pressure. This one's the yield map from the elevator. So just go, you know, again, for finer subtle differences, but some 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 higher level differences at the ends of the field due to turning elevators off, turning elevators on, and those sort of arrangements as to as to you know what the, the finer differences that we could look at in these in these yield maps. And so when you look at the predicted yield versus actual yield. You know, they, they weren't too bad, 0.77 for that for the chopper and 0.86 for the elevator. So reasonable results there. So then we started, I had, had a student that was interested in, in the impacts of varying pour rate on sugar loss. 
So you can see here that, so this, what we were doing was, I'll, I'll click through all of these slides and then I can talk to them all together. So what we had was you had, had a fertiliser trial where the yield of the crop was, was uh, sorry, the yield of the crop was constrained by fertiliser. So we were having a step rate yield change into the harvester and how that would then impact the amount of sugar cane that was getting blown back out onto the field through the primary and secondary extractor. So uh, what that meant was that the, the yield was assessed by going in doing a six, a 10 store extraction, look at what the yield was. You can see there's a, a, a low fertiliser, low fertiliser plot beside a higher one. So I think this might be, you know, 40 tonnes per hectare in the front and 70 or 80 tonnes per hectare, the, the plot behind it. So the plots were four rows as well. So we were picking the middle row of that to go through and harvest and do this evaluation on. So this invisible loss technique that I'm talking about was we, we put tarps out on the field before the harvester goes past. It catches all the material that's blown onto the tarps as you're cutting those particular plots. It's then homogenised through a wood chipper. You then subsampled. It then goes away for colorimetric analysis. So we could figure out how much sugar cane, how much sugar was left on the field. So how much, you know, the impact of the pour rate through the harvester, the ability of the primary extractor to withdraw the trash. Obviously, if you crank that primary extractor right up, you can pull everything through. So it's that trade-off that the student was, was looking at evaluating. And so um, we then had those sensors on the harvester that I've talked about previously. Might be on the wrong way. So, um, so yeah, so, so sorry, I was slightly wrong. So it was 75. Oh, 75 kilograms of nitrogen were applied in that, that front plot, 225 kilograms were applied in the black plot. So, so the impacts meant that there was a varying growth rate there. Um, also, you know, so what the argument we're making that water compaction, disease, pests have similar impacts. You know, here it was contrived because we had been constraining the attrition to the crop, but that would be experienced in various parts of the field, you know, add compaction to that list and all those other things that we might be interested in. So we've got a um, CCS equation. I don't know whether you guys use something similar, but the, um, so this was what we were using to then look at how much sugar cane was, was left in the field, how much sugar was left in the field and it's part of the payment formula, so so it 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 can it can drive what's happening in the field. So in those plots, we had we had a three, sorry, a four, a five, a six kilometer per hour harvesting speed. We had a range of different fan speeds there, and so the CCS that we were looking at, so that was the CCS of that went to the, the the billets that went to the mill. We had a, a tons per hectare cane loss going on there. So we had a a, 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 a return to farmer. So, and some of that is also then driven by the density of the products that are in the cane wagons, that are in the wagons that go to the mill. So the, the second last line there is the, the billet density. So how many how many tons were in those those uniform size bins? So you can see uh, as so across here we've got 650, 850, 1050. So as the fan speed goes up, the cane loss goes up markedly, and we can see that as the speed of the harvester also goes up, the cane loss starts to drop because of the the ability of that fan to pull material through. So the student was doing the, the economic evaluation of that, and that was where his, his PhD ended up. So, um, yeah, this work, so we're trying to continue some of this work. So the student was from Thailand, from Kezitsart University. 
Thailand grows a whole lot more sugar cane than what we do, I think 10 times more than what Australia does. So we're try- looking at trying to make relationships with a, with the guru of cane harvesting, this part of the world, Chris Norris, over with that university as well. So all of those maps and the information, so when you've got reliable yield maps, you can see through the middle there, factored over NDVI from satellite imagery. We've got EC going on in there in the bottom layer. When you've, it gives you the, the confidence to make decisions on what's going on. And so the farmer here decided that all of, you know, his driver was soil sedicity indicated by the bottom layer, which was evident in the in the imagery in the middle layer that the, the high sedis, the highly sodic area of that field was the lowest lowest um, NDVI, which was the lowest yield. So that's where the farmer decided to apply more gypsum. So he was applying the same amount of gypsum across the it, it was, he wasn't applying any more gypsum to the entire field. He was just doing it in a more discerning fashion where he was giving it to the parts of the field that needed it. So then I started, so I then got a project looking at, 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 at how do we come up with, how do we try and reduce herbicide resistance and herbicide use? So we got a project where we started utilising existing spray technology. So if the spray is, say, less than, um, in this part of the world, if it's less than 10 years old, it's got the ability to turn each individual section on independently. So we thought, you know, rather than going fully down the road of, of sense, and, sense and spray or precision spot sprayers with a green seeker or a weed it or the like, which is in this part of the world, $5,000 a metre for the sensors to go on the boom. We thought, let's try and use a UAV with a camera on board. We developed some software that enabled us to, to generate prescription maps that we could then feed back into this existing technology to get farmers part the way down the road of precision spot spraying. So the, 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 the work plan was capture the images, put it through PIX4D, which is off the shelf orthomosaicing software, generate a spray map. So using the software that we were developing at USQ, come up with a shape file that we could then load into the sprayer and then go out and spray. So none of this is probably new to you guys because you're doing this all the time. So, you know, pick the field that you're interested in. The drone goes out and sprays it and then comes back and you auto mosaic it together. Oh, sorry. So this is at the university in Toowoomba. So this is a field. We put a rotary hoe into it and lifted the rotary hoe up in various spots as we were going through the field. So you can see these little green spots uh, where we lifted the rotary hoe up. So, so spots of the field were green. So we were doing an evaluation at the time. So we then flew it with the drone, generated the prescription map that we put into the little sprayer. And so, the, so that's the, the spray map. And this is the, the actual um, a, a five section, 12 metre spray boom behind a little John Deere tractor that thinks it's a much bigger tractor. So this had full auto steer on it, it was a 4066R, so like a, a small turf tractor. And so it had all of the tech on it that enabled it to go out and, and do section control of the boom. So you can see here that we've got two, two sections of the boom spraying off to the right as it's coming along. This one, it'll just finish spraying this one. I've got a little video that I might play at the end if we've got a, a time. I don't know how the video will go over over this 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 distance. So I'll maybe keep going through these slides and we'll catch up on it. So we did all sorts of evaluations of what where we were at. So we had some some weeds in the field. So each of those there's a, there's a weed in the field. We put a sheet of A4 paper beside the weed with some dirt on top. We had dye in the sprayer, so we went and identified small, medium and large weeds. We identified 200 across the field. We then flew it. We then went back and sprayed. So loaded that prescription map into the sprayer, went out and sprayed it. And so 
of those of the 200 weeds that we that we identified we hit 93 of them so the total field was 11.2 hectares we sprayed six so we had a, a chemical saving of 44 percent across that field so so that gave us confidence in what we were doing was 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 right sorry and, and we could document it and 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 see what was going on so in that we had small medium and large weeds the algorithm that was built was was enabled enabled us to to look at sizes of weeds and all of those sort of things to try and understand what we're doing but when we started doing that they thought well you know this this tool is is quite handy for doing other things so we started flying this is uh, macadamia nut trees in Bundaberg using PIX4D. So, you know, we're interested in whether the farmer would, was in, would, would want to know the sizes of the trees that he's got, or even, goodness knows, the, the size of the, 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 the shadow underneath is indicative of the, the, the canopy structure of the tree. Why have you got some that are missing? Why are they're smaller trees in particular areas. You know, all of those things that you can, those questions you can start to answer once you're up, up above a crop looking at what's going on. We also then went into, into cotton. So this is a cotton field. The, the farmer we were talking, so this is a, an, a, 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 we call it skip row cotton. So this is dry land cotton that doesn't have enough rainfall. So grown in, in areas where, you know, rainfall's marginal. So the approach there is that you only plant two of every three rows so that the, the these two rows can access, you sort of, you know, change the density determined by how much water you've got and how much water you think you're going to get. So the farmer said it's a real pain in the bum picking weeds in, in this skip row cotton. So that started us down the path of, of looking on a much finer spatial scale to, to come up with, with um, prescription maps. I don't have the prescription map there, but we were able to, you know, know where the cotton should be, look elsewhere, come up with a prescription map that the farmer could deal with. And so that then got, so using that algorithm that we just saw there, we, we were doing the same thing in sugarcane. So this field happened to be organic sugar cane grown by Bundaberg Sugar in Bundaberg. And so you can see that, you know, up here in this part of the, so this is the same field, I've just zoomed up on it. So you can see some of the things that are going on in there. So the cane had been harvested about three weeks. So it was starting to grow again. And so what we did, and so the, the farmer was interested in areas like this where there are a lot of weeds you know, where, where should he, being that it was organic, where should I employ my labour force to go and hand chip these weeds or how much of the field or the quantification factor? Sorry, guys. Um, but we said, yeah, well, let's have a crack at that. So so we we flew it, we identified where the sugar cane was and then we, so using that similar cotton algorithm, we started to look elsewhere. So, so this is... Uh, a, pres a, a prescription map should should they have a chemical that they could spray it with a boom spray but but you know the the the, the guys we're doing it for said well we now know most of our weed problem is is down those rows that's where we could identify that's where we could go to that area to to with our workforce um but you could also go in and do some spraying so this crop that's there is guinea grass so we were then looking at saying you know we could actually pick where the get so here you can see we've picked the guinea grass in a growing sugarcane crop so you know that the potential of doing green from green detection when you when when you know where to go looking was the ability that we're coming up with there so that was what we were looking at at, at taking forward as well but we were starting to do all sorts of other things with that ability to look on a much finer spatial detail. So here we were looking at flowering of pineapples. So that's a pineapple flowering. That gets a little bit bigger and that's the end result. So the, again, the same algorithm. We, we went looking 
previously we were looking for green. Now we thought, let's start looking for red in the image. And uh, why the farmer would like to know that is if he knows when the pineapple's flowered, he knows that in eight months' time, then I'll have a ripe pineapple there. So the thoughts were we could look towards mechanised harvesting if we knew to within a couple of centimetres where the ripe pineapple is going to be. So we did some work. We picked out, so these are our plots of, of pineapples. We picked out that particular bay of pineapples there, run the algorithm over that, and so this is a, a blow-up a zoom in of that area and so that was using the algorithm to pick where the redness of the pineapples is which then enabled us to say we know how many pineapples are in that field which is a problem we know when they flowered all of those sort of additional agronomic decisions you could make once you know that information and we're still progressing this to use it as a management tool which you'll see in some subsequent images with with Broccoli that we uh, that we are working on as well. So what what the the weed algorithm enabled us to do was to pick where the centre of the pineapple was. Initially, we we're looking at the green spot. So when the pineapples were little, you you pick this spot, and so this is the exact same spot done automatically through with at about a one week interval. So what we were looking for is as the pineapples start to turn red. So this is the HSV colour wheel. So what this graph means that you can see here is we've got a colour from the HSV colour wheel and we've got weeks down the bottom. So as we get to towards here, so week four, we're starting to see the colour change. So it's going from, from greens up in this range, so up in the, you know, the, the, the 30s and the 40s, coming back towards the reddish type colour. So that's over over in these two instances so we're not looking at the whole plant what we've been doing is clipping out 10 pixels in the middle of that so it's probably only over a couple of centimeters is the size that we're looking at there looking for that color change so that enabled us to say okay the pineapple's now flowered we now know where we're going to go and harvest it and so this is a couple of other pineapples in that room so at different growth stages that you can see there so we were picking them up either way so we're progressing that that um, application for for um make for, for making better management decisions in pineapples um, so a similar approach we've taken in broccoli so broccoli is both transplanted and both seeded in australia and so sorry so Although you can't see it here, you can probably just pick a little green speck. So that the broccoli had just germinated through the soil. So we, we flew it every week or so and tracked various features throughout time. And so, uh, so this one I think was earlier in, in March. So I think there's a couple of weeks difference between these images. So you can see this 97 in the centre of the screen is the exact same spot. So you can see that there are some broccoli there that are, I might just go up a couple. So there are some broccoli there that are not doing a whole lot for whatever the reason. So that's a, a zoom back out of that field. And so I'll continue to go down. I might come, I'll go backwards again so you can have a look. So you can see there are some broccoli there that are, that are particularly healthy um, and, and some that are not doing very well at all. And so this is getting towards harvest time, you're getting bigger and starting to fill in the gaps. And here we've got a harvest. So this image is after there'd already been one pass through the field harvesting the broccoli. So you can see these lighter coloured spots are where broccoli had actually been taken from. So we were looking at that as a as a, a way of assessing what was going on. If we go back, so the 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 assumptions we we're making is that broccoli in that instance and these ones close to this gap are going to be getting more water, more nutrient, more sunlight. Therefore, they're going to grow quicker. Therefore, the farmer has to be able to deal with them. 
Um, COVID's really thrown a spanner in the works of workforce in Australia. A lot of this was done by backpackers that come in from all different parts of the world, but with all borders being shut, it was it was particularly difficult. So, you know, the farmers were really struggling with with a limited workforce. How do I maximise my return? So, you know, this these layers of information enable the farmer. What we're proposing enable the farmer to have a, a better understanding about you know, the spatial variation he's got across the field, what are the drivers of the system, if I've only got a limited workforce, where do I direct them to have the best to optimise the return that he's got for the information that he's been able to do, et cetera, et cetera. So working in that space. Um, so that was, those images we looked at were from a year ago. This one, this information here is only from a couple of months ago. And so here you can see 10 days after emergence. So I've had a nut. So this is, but this is student work that I've been looking at here. We've been flying it and running it through the weed algorithm, but the student's been evaluating what's going on. So um, I had another student, a guy from Brazil was working with us. And so, you know, the, 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 and I haven't got a photo of the harvest aid, but there's a big boom. People walk through a field, cut them, put them on the thing. They develop, they're delivered up into a, a harvest platform, which is what the image is on the left. And so people are there grading them, sorting them, and packing them into crates. These crates are the broccoli go straight from. So within one day, they're off into the supermarkets in all of the all of the capitals in Australia. So they go into so I so these are, are crates for one of the big supermarket chains. So it goes packaged straight into there, and they are then put on the shelves in the supermarkets. So that's where the premium grade goes into those crates. But the the student was out doing all sorts of other agronomic measurements that he was using as part of his evaluation. So you can see that there's some there's some flags in the field there. So he had been dividing the field into various subplots. So he, within a, a, an area, he had 12 subplots. He was, and so each of those was 0.18 hectares. And so that column is the Woolworths grade. So that's into those black, black, um, black tubs that we're looking at, which are the premium grades of broccoli. And then he had a seconds grade that is happening as well. But, you know, that was definitely wasn't all the broccoli that were left in the field. And so he's, he's, he's currently evaluating, you know, the total recovery from the field, the proportions here that he's then trying to relate back to the imagery that we took through the field, looking at growth rates of the, of the actual broccoli and the like, and that, that we can get from, from various... that we can look from the various sections across the field. Um, so looking at, you know, what, what we can do, what agronomic decisions we can make, how can we maximise our workforce to, to obtain what we're looking at. I think that's the last slide. Oh, yeah. And so um, uh, Hardev and Calvin have been, so with the thought of collaboration and visiting scientists and Fulbright, uh, Kelvin and Hardev have been doing some flying. So we've run, so this was some imagery that they collected down in your part of the world. And so we run it through the weed algorithm. And the idea there is we can look at what's happening with skips. So that's just a little snippet of a section of the field that we were having a look at. So we're, we're starting to do some collaboration and, and this other thing on the right, I was successful a couple of weeks ago in, so I applied last year, was unsuccessful last year, but this year I've been successful in a Fulbright to come and visit you guys. And so the title of what I'm proposing is advancing on-farm technologies to enable, enable sustainable sugarcane production. Uh, normally I'm there in March to June, 2023, so. Uh, and that's it. And I've chewed up 50 minutes. Any, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Troy. Uh, that was a great presentation. 
So please, if anybody has any question, unmute your microphone and uh, feel free to ask. Yeah, I have, I have one, Troy. Um, of course, we call it broccoli here. Yeah. As opposed to broccoli, yeah. broccoli. I, I can't make my mouth say broccoli. But <laughs> I, I was wondering, um, I did a lot of work one time with broccoli, and it was on a grant from a frozen food company. And, and they wanted us to use this particular variety because that's what their, you know, company needed to had good qualities for being frozen after it was harvested. Yep. But it was a hybrid broccoli. And right on the can, it stated uh, hybrid, 90% hybrid, 10% other. And so right <laughs> off the bat, I had 10% variation. And the 10%, some of it, it would come out looking like cauliflower. It would come out looking like, I don't know what. And I don't know if it's related to the uh, the breeding of, or the the making seeds when you have so many little flower flowerettes yeah. so close together. So I yeah. wondered if that was a hybrid uh, broccoli, which could have some of the same problems I ran into. Yeah. So like the, the image I've got up on the screen there now is like a, a, a zoom out of the field. So there's, there's obviously a combination of agronomic irrigation machinery impacts going on. So there was a, a lateral move going over the top is why these lanes are the way they are. But, you know, there's there's something going on here to something going on in to here in the field. So, yeah, there, you know, there is the issue with germination. And because this was seeded, you know, so they, they do transplant them as well. But even with transplanted broccoli, there are there are issues with you know how well they grow so yeah so you know this this tool would enable them to assess you know is it worthwhile paying an extra you know five hundred dollars a kilogram for the seed to get the much better germination stuff or is this other stuff okay i mean now we've got the ability to be able to measure and monitor that gives them the evidence to make a better management decision on, on purely emergence. But, you know, here <clears throat> there are also impacts on, you know, the, the seed soil placement, the depth of the seed, the crusting of the soil, how much straw was left on the surface, the impact of weeds, as you can see here, you know, weed control in the, in the fallow period, all of those things are impacting on what we see there in that image. You know, it, it's up to the farmer to decide, you know, it, it, what, what's, what's, what's contributing to that variation. Can I do something about it? Is it economical to do something about it? all of those precision ag questions that you ask as part of the, you know, understanding the system that you've got? In, in that particular area, that field, they irrigated the crop up. So they planted the seed, irrigated it, and it come up. But the surface in some of those instances was quite crusty. So as the plant poked its way through the surface, there was a windy day next, and the little plant wriggling around with a crust on the surface, in some instances, it was actually ring barking the plant. And those plants weren't even surviving. So, you know, that combination of all things possible. Is, is impacted on that. Well, the farmer wasn't even convinced that was poor establishment. So, it, you know, he, he must have bigger fish to fry in this instance if, if he was thinking that, you know, from my perspective, that's not real good through the middle of that field. And I did pick a bad part of the field, but, you know, the farmer has to be able to deal with it. So, yeah. Sorry, that was a, a very roundabout way of talking about that question. Any other questions? So I was just curious, Troy, if in uh, Australia now, many of the vegetables are grown organically, is there market demand for that? Or is there export demand? Or is it mainly grown non-organically? Yeah, com combinations of both. So um, these guys, I 
these guys because they're supplying to the big supermarkets and I think the the second grade stuff is potentially then going to frozen. The broccoli growers that you see there aren't organic, but there is opportunities for organic in Australia. The sugar cane that I looked at, so this stuff here, so Bundaberg sugars, you know, there's probably five big sugar millers in Australia. Bundaberg sugar, I think, is owned by maybe oh, owned by someone, a Belgium company, I think. So they're going into organic sugar cane in a big way because it's a market niche for them. So, you know, they're putting, you know, they've probably got 1,000 hectares of organic and they're increasing it year to year because I think organic sugar cane off to Europe or wherever is three times the value of conventional sugar cane. Therefore, the inputs that you, you can afford to spend three times as much on it and you're still breaking even. So these guys are, are taking... Uh, uh, you know, are going at it in a big way. And so we've got some some research projects in the pipeline looking at that sort of thing. But, yeah, organics is is taking off in Australia as well. Troy, I have a question about sugarcane. Are you aware of or you know any research done on, uh, on counting the number of millable stocks in sugarcane using aerial imagery? Uh, not aware, but uh, I would think that that sort of thing would be possible. So, I mean, that image that you can... So, you're talking about the little shoots that come off the off the set when it's planted? Um, no, mainly at the time of harvest, before harvesting, because in our breeding programs or, or several of other trials, research trials, we normally count the number of stocks and then take 10 stock samples to to estimate the yield. Yep. So in that case, a lot of labor is needed mainly to count the yep. number of canes. So yep. if, if you can think of that, it's possible to estimate that number using aerial imagery. So uh, when, when we were doing some of the, um, the yield monitor work, I, I didn't show it, but we're also looking at Guinea grass growing in the sugarcane crop. Now I don't know what the Guinea gra- what we call. I don't know the scientific name of Guinea grass, but it's a it's it's a, a real problem in Australia. Um, but so when when we were doing the yield monitor trials, Guinea grass was in there, and so you know we were looking at the the cut face. So as as one one row is being harvested, you know, and I still think there's opportunities there to look at that next row from a haul-out vehicle because it's the, the perfect opportunity to see the number of stalks that are there, whether you've got um, other species growing in there. I'm thinking of guinea grass growing in there, the height of the crop or the up to the growing point so that you can then control the, the topper. Also, you know, you would also be able to control the base cutter. So there's a lot of information that's there that – you know, need someone to take the approach of, you know, we, we could be doing some quite interesting things, both control of the harvester, but also monitoring of other agronomic information that we can see as we're going as we're going through that field. Because, you know, it's, it's a really captive. You, you've, you've got to go up and down every row, so why not, you know, take some measurements and the like as you're going. But no, hard ever, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of anyone doing that, but I think there is great opportunity for those things that, I, that I've mentioned. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we may look at that when you will be here. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. So we will update you for the next seminar uh, that will be next month in February. Okay, thank you all. Thank, thanks everybody, nice meeting you all. <laughs>